From the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Bracely, presented by a Cloud Guru, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. You know, folks, one of the shows that we have always covered, one of the big events of every year for the last three or four years has always been DockerCon. And unfortunately, neither Aaron or I got a chance to get out to DockerCon this year out in San Francisco. But we, uh, you know, as the community has grown and we've gotten to know more people, um, it's very easy to call up some folks who, who were there. And so very cool to have Kenny Kendrick, Kendrick, Kenny Coleman joining us today. Kenny, welcome back to the show, man. It's been a while. Yeah, good thing my uh, my first name can go both ways. So I'll, I'll respond and look at either if you call me Kenny or Kendrick. That's right. That's right. I've always known you as Kenny, but uh, I think all your badges always say Kendrick. So how are you, yes. man? How, how uh, first and foremost, um, you know, all the horse racing's done. You live in Louisville, which is sort of the horse racing capital of the world. How, how have you recovered from all the, the races and the Triple Crown? Yeah, I think uh, finally we, we just killed the rest of the mint juleps last weekend. You know, you got to make a big batch of that before the races. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's always a great time here in Louisville is during derby season because there's always parties happening. You got private jets that are starting to fill up all the runways. It's just a it's just a really good time to be in the city because it really starts coming alive for, you know, a, a few, just a horse race that lasts, you know, two or three minutes. So it's it's really a fun time. Yeah. And, and the city stays pretty active, like from the derby all the way through the end of, of, of the Triple Crown, or is it mostly just around the derby? Oh, just around the Derby, you know, with the Triple Crown just finishing up, everybody is very excited about it because it's uh, we all there's actually a few people that know one of the part owners of Justify. So watching Justify kind of just own the field this year was pretty incredible. And I think it's been pretty crazy how there there was never a Triple Crown winner from like it was like the mid 1970s up until early 2000s. And now mm-hmm. I think we've had like three in the past few years. So right. it's uh, it's pretty incredible to kind of see the pedigree of horses that are even coming out on days. Exactly. Exactly. Well, listen, um, we're going to talk about technology. Um, you and I, uh, I don't want to say we have a we have a conflict with Docker, but, we, you know, in our day jobs, we both um, work on technologies that may be construed as being you know, competitive. I mean, in some cases we partner with Docker in other cases, they may be competitive. So we're going to, we're going to kind of treat today's conversation about DockerCon um, as independent as we can. So we, we're, we're going to try not to put any bias on it, but before we get into that, um, you, you've been running a, uh, a very popular uh, other podcast. So tell us a little bit about Bourbon Pursuit, because I know the listeners of our show um, care about more than technology. So tell us about Bourbon Pursuit. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, Go back to it again, you know, being from Kentucky, I've uh, just had a knack for bourbon, which is uh, 95% of the world's production is made from about an hour of my door. So anything Jim Beam, Knob Creek, uh, Heaven Hill products, Mark, Maker's Mark, you name it, it's all relatively close to me. And we had the idea a few years ago to start a podcast and interviewing a lot of the people that are behind everybody's favorite brown water. And now it's grown to the be the number one bourbon podcast on iTunes called Bourbon Pursuit. So, yeah, go check that out. We also do video podcasts as well that you can get on Facebook and YouTube. But it's just a way that you can sit there and hear the stories of people that are making your, you know, America's favorite spirit. A lot of it are they're very just humble people. They never really thought they would become to rock star status, if you will, in that particular world. And they're just they're just they like to say that they're just plain old Jimmy or just plain old Fred. Like, don't don't call me Mr. or don't call me a master distiller. I'm just I'm just this old guy that knows how to make good whiskey. Yeah. So. Yeah, 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 and the, and the and the show is very cool. It's uh, you know, you guys do an audio podcast, but also, you know, you're typically you're sitting down. You like you'll go out to the to the distilleries. You'll sit down with, um, you know, different people that work there. Whether it's the master distiller, or you'll you know, you'll take the cameras inside of the barrel rooms and stuff. So definitely, if you're into bourbon, if you're into you know, if you're into bourbon, if you're into whiskey, if you're just kind of curious how all that stuff works, it's definitely uh, definitely a very cool show and. Tell people a little bit about kind of the Patreon thing and how you you do things where you sometimes will uh, will send out some samples of of the good brown water. Yeah, so we it's one way we kind of help sort of uh, kickstart and fund the show is utilizing Patreon. It's sort of a mix of like NPR plus Kickstarter, where people are more than happy to donate um, some some of money three, five, ten dollars a month to this, their favorite grassroots entertainment. There's a lot of people that utilize Patreon as that platform from 
comic book writers to other podcasters, YouTube people and stuff like that. Uh, but you know, in return, we kind of have that Kickstarter aspect. So after six months, I'll send you a t-shirt or a tote bag or, um, koozie stickers, you name it. We got all kinds of stuff, even access to private bourbon barrel picks that we do as well. So it's just one way we also just try to help give back to our fans and, and keep the support of the show going. Very cool. Very cool. Well, yeah, folks, definitely take a look at it. We'll put uh, the details in the show notes. All right, man, let's talk a little bit about technology. Um, you were out in San Francisco this week. What was what was your general take on on DockerCon, which is, you know, always at least in the container world or sort of cloud native world been, you know, one of the three or four flagship events for the last three or four years? Yeah. So, I'm, you know, let's kind of set the stage a little bit, right? Because, you know, you've been to DockerCon before. This yep. was my fourth DockerCon being there. And so I've had the opportunity to kind of be there except the first year when it was going on to kind of see the transition of, of what's happened. And every year there was this sort of set expectation of what you sort of saw at DockerCon. Um, you know, you, you come in, they're going to talk about some new features or new functionality. Uh, they might open source a new project. They might um, show something really innovative. And a lot of that was was really missing this year. And that's because I don't really know if, you know, it's, it's, I should say that it was very little dev focused, right? I mean, you, you kind of looked at what Docker was really becoming was helping to solve problems with packaging up applications for developers, maybe more closer to DevOps. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was really dev focused. So they had a lot of tools that were built into it. I mean, for the past few years, really getting, you know, putting things like Docker Notary out there, um, you've got, you know, just other kind of sk- image scanning, you've got all kinds of things that they were doing and pushing open source projects to really make, you know, fill a lot of these gaps that are uh, to really make the story whole. But this year it was really focused and became an enterprise push. And you kind of saw that out of the gate where the only really ounce of technology they talked about was at the very beginning of the first keynote where they sort of played this little developer role talking about Docker for Windows and Docker for Mac. And then from there out, it was all Docker EE. It was um, some customer success stories. So it really missed a lot of the the technical aspects. And just to even point it out is that this is the first DockerCon I've been to where there was no new open source project that actually came from Docker. Wow. Um, it was just everything was just focused on Docker EE. So in my opinion, you know, coming from, you know, the past few years coming to this, you, you kind of missed out on a lot of those things. And I think this is also kind of a maybe a pivotal difference in what we've seen in the change of, um, of the leadership from up top. But, you know, there's there's no Solomon, uh, no Diogo, no Jerome in there anymore. Jesse's not there anymore. Kelsey was nowhere to be found. It seems that all these people that were really there that were part of the meaningful growth of the technology and the hype have kind of moved on right now. So it was it was really kind of hard to to kind of see that. Um, you know, at least coming from the, the tech background ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was always a show that, you know, you looked forward to, you know, what, what new innovation was going on. There was always, you know, the thing about Docker, especially the project was, you know, there was tons of people contributing. There was a lot of interesting things happen. And then you would go to DockerCon and there would always be three or four things that Docker was kind of had been holding back um, that were that were very interesting. You know, they were like you said, they were a new security thing. They were a new sort of plug in model for, uh, you know, bringing together a bunch of the ecosystem. Um, you know, and I, and I think it does speak to them having a new CEO. I, you know, I think everything we've ever read about uh, about the new CEO is that, you know, he was brought in to, to focus the business. Right. He's he's somebody who had experience. Um, selling companies, raising funding, um, selling into the enterprise from from previous jobs. So not surprising, but yeah, definitely, um, you know, definitely a change. What did you get a chance to talk to, uh, you know, many people that were kind of walking the hallways as to, you know, what their opinion was or their take on kind of the change of uh, perspective or change of tone from uh, from Docker? Yeah, I mean, I, I sure did. I, I reached out to a few different people. But, you know, there was one thing that they had talked about in one of the first keynotes and I really found that uh, pretty amazing myself is that they said half the attendees to DockerCon were first time attendees. Hmm. So they had the opportunity to sit there and sort of start fresh with almost half of a new audience. And so I did get the opportunity to talk to a lot of these people that were most of them were first time attendees and they loved it. Um, You know, and they they thought that was great. They thought the content was great. They thought the keynotes were great. And I think there was just something that maybe just, you know, like I said, just kind of being the 
the older crowd of seeing it, you know, grow through these gener or these these past few years, uh, I thought it was missing something. Um, we talked to a few other people that were also um, sort of had this same sentiment where they really thought that. Um, you know, it was just missing some more of the technical components, right? Like, have they really lost a lot of the, um, the, the technical innovation that's there? Because the only times you would see anything is just through their proprietary software now utilizing Docker EE. Um, everybody kind of came to the consensus that it was very, very heavy on Windows focus. Right. And that could definitely be a, a strategy for them because there is a, a whole .NET market that is very enterprise focused that is going to need that sort of tooling. However, it, that doesn't seem like it was the, you know, a, a big intent early on, but perhaps it's been pivoting and they're really looking at uh, windows to be able to take on that because, you know, it could just be a future land grab opportunity. Uh, you know, if you think about uh, just the past dealing with VMware, you know, windows hosts were the collective landslide right. with that versus Linux VMs. And so this could just be a, a, a big dot net play to say, well, let's not worry about, you know, the cloud native pieces of it yet. Like that'll come along. Let's start capturing a market that is just trying to replatform their applications and getting on to uh, just a container in general. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think that makes a lot of sense if I mean, at the end of the day. You know, most of the things in the enterprise, you know, they're, they're either Windows or Linux, uh, they're, they're Java or dot net. Um, and, you know, I think to a certain extent. Docker built some brand awareness with the early work they did with Microsoft about trying to to get containers into Windows. Um, you know, I think it's you know they didn't necessarily get a chance to capture the market for that because uh, a lot of that work was done on on Swarm, and then you know we've seen Microsoft sort of pivot to say, hey, we're we're going to focus on on Kubernetes, and so you know you're now having to see them do that work more in lockstep with the Kubernetes community, which means, you know, it's most likely, you know, later part of this year and all, but yeah, it would make a lot of sense. Um, you know, I think especially if you're, if you're selling into work groups that, that have a lot of windows, that they want to try and try and be efficient with. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it is interesting. I think your point about, about there being a lot of new people, you know, we're seeing that at sort of every event. And I think, you know, you can read into that as, is that growth in an individual, you know, given company, which, uh, you know, or, or given sort of uh, community, which, you know, is very possible. I, you know, I think when we see it across DockerCon, KubeCon, some other events, you know, it also is a, a good indicator that, you know, we're, we're kind of crossing the chasm of the very early adopters of some of this container stuff to it becoming much more mainstream. And the mainstream is trying to sort out, you know, do I pick option A? Do I pick option B? Do I, you know, go option C? Um, and I think for the industry, that's probably a good thing. It, 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 it says, look, there's, there's going to be a lot of growth. There's going to be a lot of opportunity in this space. And, and there's going to be a lot of opportunity for people to learn, you know, that are still new in this stuff. So, you know, I know like over on, on pod CTL, we always have to keep reminding ourselves, come back to the basics. There's a lot of people that don't know this stuff. They're not living with it every day. Keep coming back to the basics. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing that you could tell was, was pretty prominent. There was a lot of just the, the intro things, the hands-on labs that they had there were, were full of a lot of people that were probably still just getting used to it. You know, actually working there at a booth this, this past week, I mean, I had, I had, Plenty of people that came and talked to me just about, oh, yeah, we're just now starting or we've got um, a few virtual machines spun up with a few containers that are running, but we haven't figured out orchestration of what we want to do yet. And so there's definitely some people that are just still, you know, getting kickstarted in that journey. And some of the sessions were really kind of focused towards that as well. You know, they had a lot of a lot of good sessions that were really based on customer success stories, which ideally is what they need to be able to push that message to everybody else in the enterprise that you know, don't be scared of this technology. It's going to be coming like watch, look how these other people did it. Right. Right. Um, yeah. You, you had a lot of, it was interesting. You know, they, they tried very hard in the day one keynote. I know Gareth, um, Gareth was on stage and, uh, you know, he was like, Hey, it, it, you know, GUIs are okay. You know, not everybody has to be a CLI person. GUIs are okay. Let's, let's be, let's be okay with that. And, and, you know, that just sort of reinforces the idea of, you know, the enterprise never goes that fast. You know, what, what can be, successful in the enterprise a lot of times can be, you know, again, focus on simplicity, not having to change skills. And, um, you know, it's not a, not a bad approach for, you know, given where they are in the marketplace and, and where they're trying to go. Yeah. I mean, you know, going back to the whole GUI thing, if we go back to the first day keynote and it was really talking about the, the new templating feature that they have with inside of Docker for Mac and Docker for windows. And the majority of it was basically, it's basically a, uh, 
you know, maybe a Docker Compose builder that's all based in a GUI, right? And really cool, but, you know, that's one thing that we see, you know, even coming from enterprise side of software is that, you know, GUI sell at the end of the day, right? Yeah. And and so there wasn't anything that was really heavily focused on the command line at all when they did anything in the regards of the keynotes, uh, even talking about anything as simple as, you know, updates to Linux kit or something like that, right? Um, a lot of these things that they're very proud of last year to talk about open sourcing and bringing it to the market and how it's going to uh, really help, you know, close the loop and everybody can be very happy in the container market again. You know, there was really no... Um, no focus on that at all of just open source and the community in general is just it was very much just moving towards that that enterprise kind of show that maybe we would expect out of you know a lot of the larger companies that are out there but this one was just sort of a surprise at least for me this year to kind of go it and see it a little bit more commercialized yeah you know i know there was uh, you know I, I saw some things um you know there were some serverless panels and so forth were there any uh, you know, any technologies or talks that you saw that were that were kind of interesting, maybe that, uh, you know, still piqued your interest in terms of, you know, being technical enough to be you know, worth the visit and so forth? Yeah. So, yeah, there was, you know, the serverless thing is really starting to trend. Right. And, you know, credit to Alex Ellis for developing OpenFaz and getting on, on stage for the cool hack session last year. And really seeing it grow, and that's sort of what it also started, really starting to help kickstart the the serverless trend that was been happening at DockerCon. So you did have a few different serverless sessions. There weren't too many, right? Because I think at the end of the day, that's just more abstracting away from the the underlying platform they're trying to sell. But you know, one thing that we did see also was just the cool hack session again this year, uh, focused on yet another server serverless technology that sort of combined microservices and a few other things together. And, you know, in my opinion, in regards to the lack of technical content, the cool hack station, or the cool hack session kind of, kind of saved it at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, you know, you got to hear some stuff from NASA uh, about what they're doing of exploding asteroids in space. Um, you had eat it at the very end of the day that actually um, open sourced the new project from solo IO. And uh, honestly, I think that was the only project that was open sourced the entire time of DockerCon. So, uh, you know, credit goes to her and her, her startup about actually having the only open source project that happened during the week. Wow. Yeah. No, that, why that is a, that is a huge change of pace. Cause it always was an event that, um, you know, not only Docker would want to announce stuff, but anybody who was in the ecosystem or even competing with them wanted to, to sort of jump on that, uh, that train. Um, did you get the sense? I'll sort of wrap it up with that. Cause I think we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, fleshing out what what the event was like. Did you get any sense? You know, Docker's always been, you know, at least when Solomon was there, there was always. I, I think he sort of fancied himself as as having a little bit of the Steve Jobs kind of flair for design, and and he wanted to make sure that he could take complicated stuff and make it simpler, tie it together. It was kind of an Apple kind of approach, right? Docker, you know, for a long time, you know, was like, hey, we're we're going to be simpler to get containers running, or be simpler to join a, a Docker swarm. Um, you know, did you get any sense from people that have been swarm people now that Docker seems to be mo- trending more towards Kubernetes about being frustrated that that it's harder or do they feel like they're making the transition in sort of the Docker way or did you not hear that at all from anybody? So I, I kind of got two ways to put that, right? So in regards to somebody, you know, some people I talked to that they had a few swarm clusters running and then they were going to start looking at Kubernetes for some other things. Um, so they're kind of looking at that as a way to separate management environments versus workload environments hmm. uh, for whatever makes sense for them. Um, in, and, you know, there were some people that it, that were that were also that were there. They were very new and they had to be explained, like, what's the difference between Swarm and Kubernetes? Um, you know, there these are just a lot of these first timers that are getting into it. And they're just learning about containers because this is supposed to be like, you know, the sort of like maybe the beginning to container conference. And, you know, you start getting the orchestrator conversation that we've all been a part of that's kind of been captured headlines for the past two years. And they're already a deer in headlights. They're not, they're not really too sure, like, well, why would I go for one versus the other? Um, there's not, there was really nothing that was really put out there for them. Right. The, the other thing that, you know, really on the, on the Kubernetes front is that there was, you know, a good talk about amongst of how much they are doing with Kubernetes. But what I sort of saw out of them is that ideally what they're trying to do is sort of abstract it. Right. And they don't really want you to know if you're using Kubernetes or Swarm. Uh, it, at their, at what they're trying to do at their software level is abstract it so much that it doesn't really matter which one you're using. 
because you shouldn't care through their UI. Uh, you know, in my opinion, it's a, a brilliant move for them to try to appeal to, you know, a community that, um, you know, isn't involved that deep, but you know, the real text could be turned off by it. Yeah. So they, they definitely could get a lot of people on board with that, that, you know, if you can just sort of be hands off and not know exactly what is the container orchestrator underneath, does it really matter to you? Um, you know, it's, it's a good move by them to kind of just, like I said, just abstract it up another layer. Yeah. I mean, definitely from a dev perspective, you probably don't want to have to care about stuff. And, you, you know, we, we know how much folks love YAML and manifests and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, being able to hide those things is important. I, I think where it potentially gets tricky is, um, you know, if, if you're hiding a bunch of Kubernetes or if you're not necessarily doing all of it or, or however you're trying to abstract it, like from an ops perspective, it potentially becomes, uh, you know, challenging. If you're like, well, I want to use, you know, the best monitoring tool, the best, you know, CLI tool, the best whatever tool, like, are those just going to work or do I have to do sort of unusual things to get them to work because you really want to abstract Kubernetes for me? So, yeah, it'll be an interesting like you said, it's it. Everything is everything is sort of positioning, and and you're trying to figure out: Am I am I trying to service uh, developers more so? Am I trying to service operators? Am I trying to be a a multi cloud manager? Um, you know, so it'll be definitely interesting to watch how Docker evolves from this because I think this is definitely a a pivot point, a transition point, and um, you know, but like you said, different from from where it's been in the past. Whether that turns out to be good or bad, you know, time will tell. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to just sit here and like say all the, the negative stuff. You know, yeah. there's also some good points that, that came out of DockerCon as well. Uh, you know, first and foremost, just by the, the sheer amount of new people there, it's just a good education for the masses. Right. Yeah. It's this is a lot of first timers that are going to start entering the market. They're going to start figuring out what's going to work. They're going to they're probably going to break an app or six. But that's just part of, you know, going a, going along this journey. So they've done an incredible job just getting their name out there and entrenched so well that, you know, that just the name Docker becomes a little bit more synonymous with containers. So, you know, they've, they've kind of just captured that so far. So they're getting the rest of the industry on board. And then from there, it's just an education of, of, you know, what can sell better at that point. Right. Well, and, and we've always said, you know, Docker has always been, they've always been an innovative company. And I think, you know, there's a lot of folks in the Kubernetes community who have looked at stuff that Docker had come out with in previous years and went, "Oh man, they they just reset the bar. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to step up our game and figure out how to make something easier to deploy or more secure or whatever it is." So, you know, Docker has always been as a company, um, you know, willing to sort of push the envelope and, and again pushing it towards make it easier easier to use, easier to consume, and I think it always forces the rest of the industry to figure out, um, you know, do we need to look ourselves in the mirror and, and make ourselves better? So, you know, I, that's always a takeaway I have from DockerCon is, um, you know, what, what what does the rest of the industry need to do for things that, you know, aren't Docker branded that, that we need to make better? So, yeah, no, it was, it was still a really good conference at the end of the day. You know, like I said, great education for a lot of people. The party was pretty good. You know, you got to go to Pier 3, which uh, nice. which actually which actually right next door is Hard Water, which is one of the best bourbon bars in the country, just right there in San Francisco. So make sure you do that next time you're running around San Francisco as well. It's a great, great little place. Very cool. Very cool. Well, listen, man, uh, as always, thanks for being on the show. We'll have to get you back on more frequently. Um, folks, go check out Kenny's podcast, Bourbon Pursuit. We'll put the uh, details in the show notes. And as always, folks, thanks for listening this week, and we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more podcasts, show notes, and everything social media. And visit acloud.guru for all your cloud training needs.